All right, so, so today we will uh, continue our discussion of uh, NP completeness. Uh, so the main concepts today are going to be verification or verifiability uh, and the notion of a reduction and complexity classes. So these are going to be the main uh, concepts. OK. So <coughs> let's first uh, review the main concept from previous lecture. So the first concept was the, an uh, informal definition of MP completeness. So an MP complete problem is a problem for which there is no polynomial time algorithm that can compute the exact solution to every instance of the problem. So if there is a, a polynomial time solution that can compute uh, the approximate solution to some or even all the instances, that's not an MP-complete problem. So, and if you have a, a, a non-polynomial time solution that can compute an exact solution to every instance, uh, you know, that's, uh, that can still be uh, an MP-complete problem because MP-complete problems uh, are usually uh, problems that are looking for a combination or a permutation. So if it's looking for a combination, exhausting all possible combinations can be done in exponential time. And if it's looking for a permutation or an order, exhausting all possible orders can be done in factorial time. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, you, you can always find that brute force solution that runs in exponential or factorial uh, time. And in practice, uh, there are many NP-complete problems that are uh, handled in practice using uh, either approximation algorithms or even, uh, you know, greedy algorithms or greedy heuristics. So, uh, greedy heuristics you know in this context a heuristic is an algorithm that is not guaranteed to give the optimal solution so if, a, if an algorithm is not guaranteed to give an optimal solution we call it a heuristic and that's how we normally handle NP complete problems in practice okay so these solutions uh, exist but from a theoretical point of view we would like to have a solution, a polynomial time solution that is guaranteed to solve every instance of the problem exactly. And for these NP-complete problems, uh, such an algorithm does not currently exist. And so nobody has come up with such an algorithm, but nobody has proven that such an algorithm does not exist. Either. So we don't know if there is such an algorithm or not if a polynomial time algorithm to an NP-complete problem exists or not. This is an open question, but most people believe that such an algorithm does not exist. But no one has proven that. Okay, <coughs> so in, in today's lecture, uh, we will focus on uh, first on the concept of verification. So verification is related to the concepts of uh, decision versus optimization problem. So last time we had an optimization problem, an example of an optimization problem, and an example of a decision problem. What's a decision problem? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. So it's a problem uh, for which the solution is just a yes, no. So it's just a yes, no. While an optimization problem is a problem in, in, uh, for which the solution is finding, uh, is maximizing or minimizing a certain uh, cost function. Okay? Uh, and the example that we presented for an optimization problem was? Yeah, the TSP, that was the example. The example of a decision problem was? Yeah, subset sum. Now, in last lecture, one, one thing that we did in last lecture was uh, uh, recasting the traveling salesman problem as a decision problem. 
So how did we recast the traveling salesman problem into a decision problem? How did we do that? How did we recast the traveling salesman problem as a decision problem? So the idea was to set a certain target. To say, given a graph, uh, a complete weighted undirected graph, and given a target cost t, determine if there is a TSP tour with cost less than or equal uh, to t. So given a graph with weighted undirected and a target cost t, determine if there is a TSP tour of cost less than or equal to t. Okay, now we can talk about uh, verification of or verifiability of a problem. Now a problem, we say that a problem is verifiable. A problem is verifiable in polynomial time. If you can come up with a polynomial time algorithm that can verify the correctness of a proposed solution. So there is a you are given a problem and someone gives you a proposed solution and your job is to determine if the proposed solution is correct or incorrect. The question is, can you do that in polynomial time or not? So let's see if we can do that for the problems that we have studied last time. So for, uh, for the subset sum, so given a set S and a target T. So someone gives you a proposed solution. Uh, let's call it uh, uh, you know, S prime. Someone gives you a subset. So let, let's put just some numbers. If S equals 2, 3, 4, and T equals, so this is an example. S is 2, 3, 4, and T is uh, 7. Someone says, okay, this is my, a proposed solution for you. S prime equals 3 and 4. And your job is to determine whether the proposed solution is correct or incorrect. Now, given an instance of the problem and a proposed solution, can you verify in polynomial time if the proposed solution is a correct solution or not? How can you verify this? What do you need to do? We can add all the elements and check if it is equal to t, and then we can, uh, if it is correct, then we can check if they exist in the original set. Yeah, exactly. So you have to check two things. You have to check, first you have to check if these elements exist in the set or not, right? So you have to search for 3 in the set, and you have to search for 4 in the set. So you have two search problems. You know, even if you do, uh, if the set is not sorted in any way and you do linear search for each one, uh, so this is, uh, you know, this is in the worst case n and this is n. So in the worst case, this is n squared, right? So you, you can do an n squared, you can uh, 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 search for these given elements to see if they are in the set or not. Then you compute the sum and see if the sum is equal to the target or not. If both tests pass, then this is a correct solution. So here you can easily determine in polynomial time if a proposed solution is correct or not. So this is what we call verifiability. So the subset sum is verifiable in polynomial time.
is verifiable in polynomial time. Okay, so now let's switch to the traveling salesman problem in its optimization form. So given a graph, so someone gives you a, uh, a proposed solution and a proposed solution is for the traveling salesman problem what will that proposed solution look like what's the solution to the traveling salesman problem a tree. Hmm? A tree. it's a cycle right so it, you, th they have to give you a sequence of vertices what's a cycle a sequence of vertices so it's sequence of vertices Can you verify that this is an optimal solution? Because the correct solution for the TSP optimization, the optimization version of TSP, is an optimal solution. So if, if someone tells you, okay, I have this solution for you, E, A, B, C, D, A. Suppose that this is our instance, the one that we did last time. If someone gives you this instance and someone gives you this solution, can you verify that this solution is indeed optimal? Well, and we don't know how to find the optimal solution, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's there is no way to verify that a given solution. There is no way to generally verify that a given solution is optimal unless you solve the optimization problem itself. So, okay, someone gives you a solution. You have to first verify that it's, it satisfies all the constraints of the problem. So in this case, you want to verify that all of these vertices belong to the graph. So you want to make sure that someone doesn't give you a solution like this, A, B, E, C, D, A. So this is an invalid solution because it has a vertex that does not belong to the graph. Or someone gives you, you know, A, B, C, B, uh, C, B, you know, some uh, path that is not a simple path. So this is not a, a TSP tool because they are repeating B multiple times. So this is invalid. So I have to check all of this. This is easy to verify. But what is not easy to verify is optimality. To verify that it's optimal. And I can ca calculate the... I can calculate the cost of this. I can just sum the, the edge weights and this will give me, you know, four plus four is eight. So this is a correct solution. You know, it, it satisfies all the constraints. It's, uh, it's indeed a cycle and all the vertices exist in the graph and I'm not repeating any vertices and the cost is eight. But so what? Is eight optimal or not? Now, generally speaking, in order to answer this question in general, you have to solve the optimization problem, which is something that we don't know how to do in polynomial time. But in some cases, if someone gives you a solution and you calculate the cost, in some cases you will be able to tell that it's optimal. When? Can you show a counterexample? I'm sorry? Can you show a counterexample? Can you show? Oh, a counterexample? Yeah. You find a better solution? Find a better, yeah, if you can find a better solution, but in general you don't know how to do that, right? You don't know how to find a better solution. You may or may not find a better solution. But under what conditions will you be able to prove that a given solution is optimal? Yeah? If you were given a target? Like a we haven't, no, we haven't discussed this yet. We haven't moved to the uh, decision version of the problem yet. 
Okay, so we are still talking about the optimization version of the problem. So under what condition you may be able to say that, yes, I know that 8 is indeed optimal, given what we have discussed last time? Well, if the, if the cost of this is equal to a lower bound, if you can calculate a lower bound, remember the lower bounds that we have calculated last time, they can be calculated in polynomial time. So usually you can calculate lower bounds in polynomial time. And if the cost of this proposed solution happens to be equal to the lower bound, then it's provably optimal. Then you know that it's optimal because it's equal to the lower bound, right? But this will not work in, in general. You know, this is not guaranteed to work in all cases. So in some cases, if the if your lower bound is tight enough, then you may be able to catch you know, some of these cases and prove them optimal, but this, was, this is not general enough. This will not work in all cases. Okay, so this is the verifiability problem. So TSP optimal is not verifiable in polynomial time. TSP optimization is not verifiable in polynomial time. Now, what about uh, TSP decision? Now, if we switch to TSP decision, The decision version of the problem, so you are given a graph and you are given a target. If someone gives you a proposed solution, which is a sequence of vertices, Can you verify that it is correct? It is correct. Now see, the definition of correctness here is different. The definition of correct here is it's an optimal solution. Now, what's the definition of correct in the context of TSP decision? What do we mean by correct in for TSP decision? If it can be a solution or not. That means if it is covering all the vertices. Okay. Not repeated. Okay. So that's all of that is a legal solution, but that does not necessarily mean that it's correct. What else do we have to check? Yeah. Path is equal to the target? Yeah, exactly. If the cost is equal to the target. So correct here means it's legal. Legal, it's a simple, it's indeed a simple cycle that belongs to the given graph and meets the target. Or is it still the target? Well, the target is normally less than or equal or greater than or equal. So if it's legal, legal here means you verify that all the vertices exist in the graph, uh, which is something that you can do in polynomial time. You just search for these vertices. You can verify that no vertex is repeated. And then you just sum the edge weights. And if they are less than or equal to the target, then that's a correct solution. So is this something that you can do in polynomial time? Yes. Yes, you can. So. TSP decision is verifiable in polynomial time. So this is a fundamental difference between the optimization version of the problem and the decision version of the problem. And in fact, this will apply to all the optimization problems that we will be uh, studying. So usually the optimization version of the problem is not verifiable in polynomial time because you can't verify optimality. 
In order to verify optimality, you will have to find the optimal solution. While verifying that a given solution meets a certain target is something that you can do in polynomial time. Okay, so you just sum the edge weights, and that's, you know, theta e, and then compare that with the target. And that you do that after checking that all the vertices exist in the graph, and verifying that you are not repeating any vertices. Okay? And of course, you know that there is an edge, an edge exists between uh, any given pair of vertices because of what? How do we know that for the traveling salesman problem that there is always an edge between any given pair of vertices? It's complete graph. Yeah, because the input is guaranteed to be complete for the traveling salesman problem. The input is guaranteed to be complete. Okay, so now this is the concept. Now in the theory of MP completeness, there is a difference between problems that can be verified in polynomial time and problems that cannot be verified in polynomial time. So this leads to the concept of uh, complexity classes. Complexity classes. So we have complexity classes. We have class P. Now class P is easy. That's the set of problems that can be solved in polynomial time. That's problems that can be solved in polynomial time. Now examples, the examples are all the problems that we have studied in this course except Zero. Yeah, except 0, 1 knapsack and subset sum and TSP. Okay, so these are the only three problems that are MP complete, are not solvable in polynomial time. Everything else we studied in this course is solvable in polynomial time. So that includes sorting, uh, single source, shortest paths, uh, it includes uh, minimum spanning tree, uh, fractional knapsack. Etc. Okay. Now the other class is class NP. Now class NP is the set of problems that can be verified in polynomial time. Problems verified. Now, problems that can be verified in polynomial time, you know, that includes example subset sum and TSP decision. <coughs> okay. Now, the question is if a problem belongs to P, does it belong to NP? Yes, yes. yes it does. Because, in fact, Solving a problem is harder than verifying a problem. So, you know, there are problems like subset sum and TSP decision that cannot be solved in polynomial time, but can be verified in polynomial time. So solving a problem is harder than verifying. If a problem can be solved in polynomial time, then you can do the harder thing, which is actually solving it. Then if you can solve it, you can easily verify it in polynomial time. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, for example, uh, <coughs> you know, verifying, uh, if you are, if we're talking about the single source shortest paths problem, single source shortest paths problem that we solved using uh, Dijkstra's algorithm, okay? 
So if someone gives you a path and someone gives you a proposed solution, it tells you that this is the shortest path from S to A. So someone proposes a certain path. Uh, so can you verify that this path is indeed optimal in polynomial time? Yes, you can, because you can just solve the problem in polynomial. So if you apply Dijkstra's algorithm in E log V, so E log V is certainly polynomial time. So if you can solve the problem in E log V using Dijkstra's algorithm, it will give you the optimal solution. And if you know the optimal solution and someone gives you a proposed solution, you can verify that that proposed solution is legal. And then you look at the cost of that proposed solution and you know the optimal because this problem is uh, easy enough for you to solve in polynomial time and if the optimal solution is 10 and the proposed solution you know is te at 10 then it's uh, it's indeed optimal if it's more than 10 then it's not optimal okay so if a problem can be solved in polynomial time it can certainly be verified in polynomial time so, <coughs> this means that uh, this means that the relation between P and NP is P is a subset of NP. Well, we will see that, uh, you know, P and NP could, in fact, could be the same set. But uh, for now, we can say that P is, has the easier problems, which is a subset of the larger set, which is NP, the problems that can be verified in polynomial time. So here, you will have problems like TSP decision <coughs> and subset sum. You have these problems here. They belong to NP. They can be verified in polynomial time, but they cannot be solved in polynomial time. Okay, so if someone gives you a proposed solution, you can verify if it's indeed a solution that meets the target. But uh, there is no polynomial time algorithm that, given an instance of the problem, determines if there is a, a solution that meets the target or not. There is no algorithm that can decide uh, this problem. Now, <coughs> uh, the, the third class is class MP-complete. Class MP complete are, and we're still defining these informally. So later in this lecture, we will define MP completeness formally. But informally, the, these are the hardest problems in NP. What do we mean by the hardest? We mean that every problem, if we can solve one of them, we can solve all the problems in NP. So now this may sound weird, and it will, it will not make much sense until we you know, present the concept of reducibility, which is in fact the main concept that we will be focusing on today. So it, uh, <coughs> a problem is NP complete if any problem in NP is reducible to that problem. Now, what is reducible? So we will be spending most of the lecture or the rest of the lecture explaining what reducible means. So the hardest problems in MP, uh, all problems in NP or you know X is MP complete if all problems in NP are reducible to X. 
So now, what is reducible? By the way, this relation between P and MP could look differently. So we'll get, uh, you know, we will revisit this and see that uh, the relation between P and NP uh, could be different, as we will explain later. But now let's try to understand what it means for what reducible means. So reducing a problem to another, reducing problem x to problem y means that you can, uh, you can transform any instance of x into an instance of y. So problem x is reducible to problem y if you can uh, transform every instance or any, let's say any, any instance of x into an instance of y. Now, in order to explain this, I will use first an example, a simple example that has nothing to do with MP completeness. Just to uh, explain the concept of reduction, what, what we mean by reduction. So let's use a familiar example. Let you know, problem A be uh, linear equations so it's ax plus by equals 0 and let problem B be quadratic equations where uh, cx squared plus dx plus 0 equals uh, plus e equals 0. So these are two problems uh, that are familiar. You know, you have, we have seen this in elementary and uh, middle school, and we know how to solve these problems. Now, what does reduction mean? It means that if I give you a solver for a solver for B, which is a solver that solves quadratic equations. So the solver for quadratic equations takes these coefficients C, D, and E, you give it C, D, and E, and it gives you what? What does it output? Which is a value of x. Right? So it gives you the solution or the value of x that satisfies this equation. Now, if I tell you that I have a solver for B, so I have an algorithm or I have a program that can solve quadratic equations, can you use it to solve linear equations, and how? Just let c be 0. Well, yeah, exactly. So you set c to 0, and then you set d to a. Yeah, yeah you, set, you set d equals a, and you set e to b, and then it solves the linear equation problem for you okay so if if you have this solver that can solve any instance of this problem for any c d and e it should work for c equals zero so what you're showing here is that you can use a solver for one problem or an algorithm that solves a problem to solve another problem 
So in this case, we, we say that problem A is reducible to B. Problem A is reducible to B. In other words, every instance of A can be transformed to an instance of B. Note here that in this example, it doesn't go in both directions, right? Not any instance of this can be transformed into an instance of linear equations. So in fact, in this case, you know, which problem is more general? B. Yeah, B is a more general problem. A is a special case of problem B. So that's why we managed to use a solver for B to solve A. So usually it's, uh, you know, by showing that one problem is reducible to another, you are showing that this problem is more general. The problem that you are using, uh, the problem for which a, sol a solver exists is more general. Now, that the, the notation that we will be using to express this here is if A is reducible to B, we're going to say A is reducible to B. Now, this is less than or equal here in this context stands for reducible to. But now, why is using the less than or equal symbol, why is it a good mnemonic here? Why is it why are we using the less than or equal symbol and why does it make sense to use it here and why is it a good mnemonic? Yeah. Because B can be thought of as like a superset of A? Yeah, a more general problem. Yes. It's or it can be thought of as a harder problem. So if you can reduce A to B, then B is harder than A, or at least they are both at the same level of difficulty. So if you can reduce A to B, then A is, is less than or equal to B in difficulty. So here we are comparing the levels of difficulty. Now in NP-completeness, we're interested in reductions that can be done in polynomial time. So the reduction, which is transforming an instance of a problem to an instance of another problem, this reduction uh, we're interested only in reductions that can be done in polynomial time that we uh, express using the notation less than or equal subscript P, which means reducible in polynomial time. So A is polynomially reducible to B. polynomially reducible. If that, that transformation from A to B can happen in polynomial time. So here, is this the case here? How much time did we need to transform an instance of A to an instance of B in this example? Constant. Yeah, it's in fact constant. Because we just set the values of these parameters and there is only a constant number of these parameters. So it's, it's indeed constant time. Now, this whole example, I use it to explain the concept of reduction, which is using a solver for one problem to solve another problem. But this has nothing to do with MP completeness because these two problems, we know, we have seen in elementary and middle school that they have solutions and they can be solved in polynomial time. In fact, you know, they can be solved in, uh, in constant time. Okay. Now, we will, uh, you know, switch to uh, problems that uh, that cannot be solved in, in polynomial time, or to the more interesting uh, usage of reduction. Now, one thing about reduction is that when we say that x is reducible to y, so that we can transform any instance of x to n instance of y. What's interesting about this is it does not imply uh, 
that the, the transformation can be done in the other direction. So you don't have to cover all instances of Y. You only need to cover all instances of X. So every instance of X must be reducible to an instance of Y, but not every instance. So you don't have to cover all instances of Y. You have to cover all instances of X. Okay? Now let's think in the abstract. Uh, what if I tell you that I think we're, we're done with this what if I tell you that problem A is polynomially reducible to problem B and B has a polynomial time algorithm. What can you conclude from this? It can also be solved in polynomial time. Yeah, exactly. Because you can transform any instance of A into an instance of B in polynomial time. And then you can use the solver for B to solve A in polynomial time. So you can picture this as uh, this is a, an instance, instance of A. You take it and you you take this and you do a polynomial time uh, reduction. Let's call it reduction. then it will give you instance of B and you take this instance of B and you plug it into uh, a polynomial time solver for B and this will give you the solution. But both steps can be done in polynomial time because we are assuming that B has a polynomial time algorithm. This is polynomial time. And this is also polynomial time because we are saying that A is polynomially reducible to B. Okay. So, and B has a polynomial time solution. Then this implies that A can be solved in polynomial time. polynomial time. In polynomial time. Okay. Now, what if I tell you that A is polynomially reducible to B and A does not have A polynomial time algorithm. So what if I tell you that A is polynomially reducible to B and A is known not to have or A does not currently have a polynomial time algorithm, what do you conclude about B? B also does not have. B does not have. In fact here you know, the, this less than or equal mnemonic can help a lot because it, it tells you that A is less than or equal to B in terms of difficulty. And if the easier one cannot be solved in polynomial time, then the harder problem necessarily, you know, cannot be solved in polynomial time. In other words, you know, we know that this A is reducible to B. So, if uh, if B had a polynomial time algorithm, we would have been able to you to solve A in polynomial time by reducing A to B and using that 
polynomial time algorithm. So this implies that B does not have a polynomial time algorithm because if B had a polynomial time algorithm we would have been able to solve a in polynomial time okay or in other words you know you can think of this as uh, you know a is polynomially reducible to b and uh, you can think of it as a is polynomially reducible to b and b has or b is polynomially solvable A is reducible to B and B is polynomially solvable this implies that A is polynomially solvable now if you negate this if A is not polynomially solvable logically this implies that B is not polynomially solvable okay so, uh, yeah, so it's if A is, is not polynomially solvable then B is not polynomially solvable so this is the contrapositive of this so the polynomial solvability of B implies the polynomial solvability of A the contrapositive is if A is not polynomially solvable then B is not polynomially solvable so does anyone have any doubts about this okay so now what if I tell you that a is polynomially reducible to B uh, pol polynomially reducible to B and B uh, and a has a polynomial time solution what does what does this tell you about B if I tell you that yeah you cannot tell you anything right so if I tell you that the easier problem has a polynomial time solution the harder problem may or may not have a polynomial time solution and if I tell you that A is reducible to B and B does not have a polynomial time solution again you cannot draw any conclusion about A because A is easier less than or equal to B in difficulty so A may or may not have a polynomial time solution so in fact this is the technique that we will be using to prove that a given problem is NP complete by comparing it with one of the problems that are known to be NP complete so if you are working on a certain uh, uh, you know uh, you are developing a certain software and you encounter an algorithmic problem and you suspect that the problem that you are having is NP complete and you would like to prove that it's MP complete you will compare it using reductions with a problem that is known to be MP complete now how can you use this kind of comparison to prove that a problem is does not have a polynomial time solution now what what do you need to do do you need to reduce uh, the known problem to the problem that you are trying to prove or the problem that you are trying to prove to the known problem in which direction should you do the reduction well so this is the problem that you are trying to prove let's call it so x is to be proven and y is known 
known to be MP complete. Okay. Now, if I reduce x to y, what am I saying? I'm saying that the problem that I'm trying to prove is less than or equal to y in difficulty. Does this prove that x is hard? No, because it can be much easier than y. So it can be maybe it can be a very easy special case of y. But if so this doesn't prove anything. But if I prove that the known problem, the one that is known to be MP complete, like traveling salesman problem, y is polynomially reducible to x then I have proven that x the one that I'm trying to prove I have proven that it's at least as hard as a problem that is known to be NP complete so now I have proven that its level of difficulty is at least the same as a problem that is known to be NP complete so this is the right direction for proving that a problem is MP complete. So you, you reduce a known problem into the problem to be proven. Okay, so before we give examples, actual examples of reductions, uh, we have now, now we are ready to define, to come up, to, to present a formal definition of MP completeness. So now we can define uh, a problem L is MP complete if Number one, L itself belongs to NP and number two, for every problem L prime that belongs to NP, L prime is polynomially reducible to L. Okay, so you know, of course, we will not fully understand all of this stuff until we give some actual examples and some actual reductions. Okay, so what we are saying here is a problem is NP complete if the problem itself belongs to NP, which means that the problem is verifiable in polynomial time and if every problem in NP is reducible to this problem. Any problem in NP can be reduced to this problem, which means that any problem in NP is less than or equal to this L in the level of difficulty. Or in other words, L is at least as hard as any other problem in NP. Okay? Now, well, this means that using this approach, in order to prove a problem to be MP complete, we will have to prove that every problem in NP is reducible to that problem, and that's hard. Well, that, that kind of proof had to be done for the very first problem that was proven to be NP complete. So that problem was formula satisfiability. or let's call it SAT. What's formula satisfiability? I just, uh, you are given a logical, uh, you are given a logical expression, and you are asked to determine a logical expression like 
you know, x1 and uh, not x2 or x3. So a logical expression that consists of, you know, ands and ors and logical variables or Boolean variables. Is there any uh, assignment of these variables that will cause this to evaluate to true? Well, in fact, in this case, yes, there is. So if you set x3 to 1, it doesn't matter what you set x2 and xy to. Uh, yeah, because if x3 is 1, then you can set xy and x2 to 0 or whatever, and you will get the whole expression will evaluate to 1, right? Now, this is an example of a formula that is satisfiable. So you can find, you know, the assignments, 0, 0, 1 will cause this formula to evaluate to 1. Now, can you give me a logical formula that is not satisfiable? <coughs> there are no <coughs> values of the variables that will cause it to evaluate to true. A formula that is never true. X1 uh, and X2 and neg um, negation of X2? X1 and negation of X2? Well, I can set X1 to 1 and x2 to 0. Negation of x1 and x2. Yeah, x1 and negation of x1. This is a formula that is never satisfiable because it has a contradiction, right? So this is satisfiable. This is unsatisfiable. Now, if I give you a formula that consists of n variables so given a logical formula that uh, has uh, uh, variables or using variables x1, x2 through xn determine if there is an assignment we call it a satisfying assignment an assignment of the variables that will make the formula evaluate to true. Okay? Now, in general, this problem does not have a polynomial time solution. Now, what's the brute force solution here? What's the brute force solution to this problem? Try all the combinations. Yeah, try all the combinations. And how many combinations do we have? N. n. So we still the number of variables. Yeah, 2 power n. Because each variable has two possibilities, true or false. And we have n of them. So brute force is 2 of n. Uh, brute force is omega of 2 power n is at least 2 power n because th the worst case running time of the brute force solution is at least 2 power n for the worst case. Of course, there is always a best case, right? You, you can get lucky and the very first assignment that you try will evaluate to true. So remember, a best case is a lucky case. And here you can get lucky. And the very first assignment that you try will happen to be true and you are done. But in fact, if there is no satisfying assignment, there is no way to prove that unless you go through all possible combinations. So this is a problem. This is another problem. 
that is NP-complete. Now, this was the first problem to be proven NP-complete. So, uh, someone proved that any problem that belongs to NP can be reduced to this problem. If you are given any problem. So, this must be a you know, very abstract proof. So, proving that any problem in NP, any problem in NP can be reduced to this problem. So this problem, if you solve this problem, then you, solve, you can solve any problem in NP in polynomial time. Okay. Now that was how the first NP-complete problem was proven to be NP-complete. But now that we have some problems that have been proven to be NP-complete, we can use them to prove the NP-completeness of other problems. So think about this. You know, the example that I like to present here is if you are trying to identify, you know, the tallest people on campus. So we have 30,000 students on this campus you know, with faculty and staff and everything. And we are trying to identify the, the tallest people on campus. So we're trying to find, you know, those people uh, that do not have anyone taller than them. So they all tie. They're all of the same, uh, the same uh, height. And they are taller than anyone else on campus. Now, you know, this is like, this is the club of the tallest people. Now, to find one person who belongs to this club, you know, someone that has not, doesn't have anyone who's taller than him, then you'll have to compare that person with you know, all 30,000 people on campus. You have to compare that person, and if no one is taller than him, then you put him in this group, and now X is taller than anyone else on campus. But now, if you wanna add more people to this group of the tallest people, assuming that you know, the population did not change, so we are not getting new students. Uh, then, to add, you know, person Y to this uh, group, you don't have to compare person Y with 30,000 students or 30,000 people on campus. You just compare compare him with X. So if he's as tall as X, then you just add him to the group because X has already been compared with everyone else. And then, if you have person Z who claims that uh, you know, he is one of the tallest people on campus, then in order to accept person Z in the club, then you don't have to compare Z with everyone. You just compare him with both X and Y or either X or Y. Either X, either. Either X or Y. Because these people are all at the same level of height. They're all of the same height. So you don't have to compare Z with X and Y. You just compare a Z with either X or Y. So it suffices to compare Z with only one of the people who are already in the club. And then if Z is there and you want to prove you know, someone else like uh, L, then you only need to compare L with one of these guys, not all of them. So this is exactly what happens with MP completeness. So someone, w someone worked very hard to prove that this problem belongs to the group of NP-complete problems. But once this has been done, we can prove that a problem is NP-complete by comparing it with any of the problems that are known to be NP-complete. Not all, any of the problems that are known to be NP-complete. Now, given this, I can find, I can uh, come up with an equivalent statement of condition number two. The equivalent statement is instead of for every problem L prime that belongs to NP, L prime is reducible to L. I can say for any problem uh, L star that is uh, that belongs to MP complete that is already known to be MP complete L star 
is polynomially reducible to L. Okay, so L star is polynomially reducible to L. So now, you can prove that the problem is NP-complete by either taking you know, the hardest uh, route, which is proving that every problem in NP is reducible to this problem, or you can take the easier approach, which is just you identify one of the problems that are already known to be NP-complete and reduce it to this problem. And when you have multiple problems that are known to be NP-complete, you have more options. Right. And among these options that are known to be NP-complete, you only need, need to pick one of them. And if you can show that it's less than or equal to this problem in question in difficulty, then you have proven that L is NP-complete. Of course, this will make more sense when we uh, when we give some examples. So we will give multiple examples. Uh, okay, but yeah, so now if you have multiple problems that are known to, N to be MP complete, how would you pick a problem to prove that a given problem is MP complete? Based on what? What do you think? Like you have some problem that I ask you to prove, uh, like I uh, suppose that we don't know if uh, you know, you know that traveling salesman problem is MP complete and subset sum is MP complete, and you are trying to prove that the zero one knapsack problem is MP complete. Which one would you pick? Why subset sum? Yeah, so it's a good choice, but why? Because it's more similar to the problem that you are trying to prove. So we're trying to prove that this problem belongs to the club of MP-complete problems. So you find a problem in that club that is very similar. In fact, the more similar that problem is, the, uh, the less work you will have to do in showing that this is reducible to that. So you will have to find an MP-complete problem that is as similar as possible or as close as possible to the problem that you are trying to prove. Okay. We will see examples. Now, we, before we uh, move to examples, there is one more concept here, important concept. So now we are, you know, today we are doing all the abstract stuff, but, you know, next time we will be uh, showing the examples. But there are, before, uh, there are important concepts that we haven't introduced yet. Now, if a problem is, if a problem satisfies condition two, but does not satisfy condition one, then we call it MP hard. So if a problem, if a problem satisfies, satisfies condition two, but does not satisfy condition one, then or it's called MP hard. So for example, you know the, the decision form of traveling salesman problem is MP complete or MP hard based on this. So the decision form of traveling salesman problem, is it MP-complete or MP-hard? Yeah, it's MP-complete because traveling salesman decision satisfies condition number one. It is verifiable in polynomial time. Very viable in polynomial time. So for example, TSP decision is MP complete 
and TSP optimization is MP hard. Now back to that uh, uh, figure that shows the relations between Uh, P and NP. So you have P and NP. So here in P you have the easy problems like sorting and single source shortest paths and all of those problems that can be solved in polynomial time. In NP, you have the hardest problem, which are the NP-complete problems like TSP decision. But TSP optimization does not belong to NP. So it belongs to NP hard. So it's not here. Now the question is, what if someone discovers a polynomial time solution a polynomial time algorithm for solving one NP complete problem. What will the relation between P and NP look like? If someone comes up with a polynomial time algorithm for solving one NP complete problem, what will the relation between P and NP look like? Be yeah, they will be equal because if someone can solve one NP complete problem in polynomial time, all problems in NP are reducible to that problem, are polynomially reducible, so we can solve all of them in polynomial time. So here, if a polynomial time algorithm is discovered for one NP complete problem, then the relation between P and NP will look like this, P equals NP. P, P equals NP. Now the point is that if such an algorithm exists, we don't know. So this is, you know, so this is the P equals NP question. So this is an open question in computer science. We don't know if the relation is this or this. We don't know which one of these two relations is the right relation. Uh, most people think that this is the right relation between P and NP. Most people think that here, you know, we have some problems that are not polynomially solvable, or that P is a proper subset of NP. So most people think that P is a proper subset of NP, meaning, you know, proper subset means that it's indeed a subset and there is at least one element that belongs to NP but does not belong to P. So, or NP minus P is non-empty. So that's, so this is, you know, P is a proper subset of NP. Okay? So this is an open question. Nobody knows the answer to this question. Most people think that this is the case, but nobody has been able to prove this. So now in order to prove this, how, do you, how would you prove this? Further, we need to create a NP complete algorithm for polynomial time. To, to crea create a what? To prove that we need to discover that NP complete algorithm first. But how would you prove this? So you have to prove. It is done in polynomial time for every... No. For this? No. Well, for this you have to prove that there is a problem that cannot be solved in polynomial time. So you have to find one NP complete problem and you have to prove an exponential lower bound. 
on the solution time. You have to prove that there is an exponential or a super polynomial lower bound on the